Greetings, friends around the world. My name is Alexander Sarsavedis. This is Bible News Prophecies Program. Welcome. Recently, in one of his writings, the uh, Mike Gedron has written something about the Christ of Roman Catholicism. And uh, he writes about the false Christ of Roman Catholicism. That's the title of his message. And he says, we know from God's inspired word that false teachers will come and preach another Jesus that the apostles never preached. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3 and 4. So it should not surprise us that there are many counterfeit Christs in false religions masquerading as the true Christ. By far, the most deceptive false Christ is the Eucharist of the Roman Catholic Church. Then he has another subtitle, The Blasphemous Hoax That Deceives Catholics. And he says, In the Faith of Millions, a book certified by the Catholic Church to be free of doctrinal errors, Catholic priest John O'Brien explains how the Eucharist became Jesus during the Mass. Quote, When the priest pronounces the words of consecration, he reaches up into the heavens, brings Christ down from his throne, and places him upon our altar to be offered up again as the victim for the sins of men. It is a power greater than that of saints and angels. The priest speaks, and lo, Christ the eternal and omnipotent God bows his head in humble obedience to the priest's command. End of the quote. Then Mike Gedron writes about the outrageous lie and its implications. And uh, we want to comment on this, dear friends. Well, the ceremony that Roman Catholic priests perform are part of their church services. But traditionalists should understand that early church services were not like Roman Catholic Mass. In one of his booklets, Dr. Bob Thiel, uh, entitled Beliefs of the Original Catholic Church, he informs us what were early church services like. They were, first of all, he says, scripture-focused. They were teaching in harmony with Scripture, uh, and he quotes Eusebius, page 112. The teaching in harmony with Scripture is what the original liturgy or format of services was like. Notice something that about Polycarp and his teachings in the second century. For he would extend his discourse to great length on diverse subjects, and from the actual Scripture which was read, he would furnish edification with all demonstration and conviction. And on the Sabbath, when prayer had been made long time on bended knee, he, as was his custom, got up to read, and every eye was fixed upon him. Now the lesson was the epistles of Paul. This was taken from Life of Polycarp, chapter 24, from J.B. Lightfoot, The Apostolic Fathers, volume 3.2, page 488. And this publication was published in 1889, so in the 19th century. Friends, as far as original church services, Polycarp taught using actual scriptures and did so on the Sabbath, Saturday, not on Sunday. Bishop Melito of Sardis, considered a Greco-Roman and Church of God saint, said during a church service, and here is a quote of Melito of Sardis, First of all, the scripture about the Hebrew Exodus has been read and the words of the mystery have been explained as to how the sheep was sacrificed and the people were saved. Now this was Melito, that was his homily on the Passover, verse 1. Well, this is of liturgical interest as it shows that the Old Testament was being read and that Melito, of the New Testament, may not have been the only speaker and the church service included more than one sermon message. Now this is very consistent with how and with, with the practice of the continued Church of God, the Canadian Church of God has a practice of having a sermonette and sermon, or two split sermons as part of weekly church services. And here is something from a Roman Catholic writer about the early church services, which for this purpose could also be called their liturgy. Quote, The primary points of contact for our knowledge of the first central liturgy lie on one end with the Jewish liturgies and the little data which can be gleaned from the New Testament and a few texts reliable but vague from the 2nd and 3rd century that help us piece together the puzzle. Now, you need to be aware, traditionalists, of the Judeo-centricity of early Christianity. Because for about the first 10 years of Christianity, it was almost exclusively composed of Jewish converts. The early Christians were in the habit of attending temple. The early Christians continued celebrating in the synagogues alongside the Jews on the Sabbath for several years in some places. 
Up to 19 years after Christ's resurrection, new converts to Christianity, generally speaking, had to convert to Judaism before becoming Christian. Namely, they were to be circumcised, to eat kosher, and to follow the Mosaic law. Well, synaxis is the Greek word meaning meeting and is the organic continuity of the Saturday synagogue worship. When the Christians were no longer allowed in the synagogues, they continued celebrating approximately the same rite with added Christian developments and themes, like using the New Testament. The original liturgies would have been held, like the synagogue service, in Hebrew, and some of the words, like Amen and Hallelujah, survive to this day. In the early part of the first century, it is unlikely that the synaxis would have been recognizably different from the synagogue service, except for the setting. Now, basic structure, you see. Uh, the basic structure is greeting and response, the Lord be with you or peace be with you. Then, in second part comes lections and psalmody. The Jews read in order of descending importance, starting with the Pentateuch. The early Christians... They kept the original order of the synagogue, but as Christian scripture became available, it was stacked on at the end. Thus, the order of importance became reversed for Christians. They read in ascending order of importance, which would be Old Testament reading, then psalmody or chanted psalm, New Testament readings, sometimes included in non-canonical books like First Clement, psalmody, and finally, the fifth part was the gospel reading. Then was the homily, which meant the bishop would deliver while seated. Then there was dismissal of catechumens by deacon, and there was intercessory prayer of the faithful, and then dismissal of the faithful. Occasionally a collection would be taken for the poor at the end. Now by the end of the first century, the standard Christian liturgical observations would be as follows. On Saturday, you would attend the synaxis. Now this was all published in uh, 2017, and uh, 2010, it was from Troutmont T.R., Christian worship in the first century, called to communion. <coughs> now, the term catechumen that you have, you have just heard from my mouth refers to a Christian convert who is under instruction before baptism. Now, while some of these things that I've just said detailed, uh, they can be debated. Yes, dear friends, original church services called the synaxis, Synaxis means congregating or meeting. Well, those services, as I mentioned already, were on Saturday, not on Sunday. In time, the Greco-Romans adopted Sunday, with the Greeks retaining some aspects on Saturday, but the faithful in Judea and in Asia Minor, in Antioch, etc., held to Saturday. In the continuing Church of God, similar to the previous listed liturgy, we have these sets of hymns, psalms, a short message, a sermon or homily, and a closing prayer. We accept Jesus once for all sacrifice, Romans 6.10, hence do not attempt to repeat it. We also have an opening prayer as well as announcements, both of which likely were also part of the early Christian liturgy which means that we are following in the footsteps of the original church. We have not added anything to it, nor subtracted, any, uh, subtracted anything from it. Now, there was no daily nor weekly sacrifice of Jesus either, which is consistent with scriptures like Romans 6.10. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. Then also in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24, Christ... Verse 25 does not have to offer himself again and again as a high priest goes into the sanctuary year after year with the blood that is not his own or else he would have had to suffer over and over again since the world began. As it is, he has made his appearance once and for all at the end of the last age to do away with sin by sacrificing himself. himself. And then finally Hebrews 10.10 10, And this will was for us to be made holy by the offering of the body of Jesus Christ made once and for all. So, from this we can deduce that no, early Christians did not have a mass where Jesus was regularly sacrificed. The New Testament is clear that Jesus was only sacrificed once and for all. This is known, of course, to Roman Catholic writers and uh, one of them, Nash T., uh, in his book, Divinely Planned Obsolence, uh, published by the Catholic World Report, December 2017, he said, 
In that book, quote, the letter to the Hebrews makes clear that Jesus definitely ended the need for the repetitive animal sacrifices of temple worship when he suffered and died once for all, Hebrews 7.27. In doing so, he culminated his one sacrifice of Calvary in everlasting glory in the heavenly sanctuary, not a mere earthly one, end of the quote. So yes, friends, Jesus was sacrificed once and does not need to be sacrificed again. The Christian Passover is a memorial of the event. It's not a repetition of that event. So it's not repeating of the event. The Christian Passover is a memorial of the event. And I say Christian because there is also Jewish Passover. It takes on a different date and they actually celebrate the anniversary of their exodus from Egypt. Meanwhile, Jesus Christ, the night before, just before his death, just before he was betrayed and arrested and killed, he instituted the New Testament Passover. How did he do it? Well, in my book, which I have only in my native tongue, which is Serbian, I explain it, and you can find it explained in other sources. Jesus Christ actually did away with uh, lamb and, uh, and smearing the lamb's blood on the doorposts. Instead of lamb, he instituted unleavened bread as a symbol of his sinless body. And he instituted a portion of wine that we are to drink on that uh, solemn occasion, the most solemn occasion for our Christians. Instituted his, uh, the, the, instituted the wine as, as a symbol of his blood that we are to drink. And by doing so, we accept, and again, we accept the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And by doing so, we renew our covenant with uh, God that we enter into by the true biblical baptism. Now, Mike Gedron's newsletter also had uh, another subtitle, Worshipping in U- in, uh, Worshipping the Eucharist is Idolatry. And uh, let me read the quote from that because I think it's very useful. He says, Catholics who worship the Eucharist can be compared to the Israelites who worship the golden calf as their true God. Exodus 32 verse 4. The punishment imposed by God for their most serious sin of idolatry was death. Exodus 32 verse 27 and 28. The same sin of idolatry is committed by Catholics who worship the Eucharist as the true Christ. Catholics must be warned that the resurrected and exalted Christ is too awesome and glorious to be captured in any image, let alone a wafer. Exodus 20 verse 4 to 6. They need to know that God seeks worshippers in spirit and truth. John chapter 4 verse 24. Well, that said, uh, you may ask, did early Christians use around Eucharist hosts? Well, the answer from all the historical uh, uh, sources is uh, very clear. No. A careful comparison of what is taught in the Bible and the catechism of the Catholic Church along with Eucharist practices should make this clear to any truly interested in the truth. Uh, I'll quote now 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1 Be you followers of me as I also follow Christ. Oh, and the Apostle Paul is teaching that Christians are to follow or imitate him as he imitates Christ. The Greek word translated as follow or imitate is mimetes. The English word mimic comes from that word. Now, thus, all should be careful to carefully follow Jesus Christ and the Apostle Paul in this regard. Now, notice First John chapter 2, verse 6. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. As you know, in the New Testament, there is no record that Jesus Christ ever had a mass or that he held a mass with his apostles, let alone his early church in the book of Acts. Uh, in Article 3, under the seven sacraments of the church, in the catechism of the Catholic Church, you have a discussion on, uh, on uh, Eucharist. And uh, I'll just, for the sake of your information, I'll just uh, quote uh, that Jesus, they say, choose the time of the Passover, and he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, which is Catechism of the Catholic Church, published in 1995. And this, what he says, is scripture, scriptural. And here are few related scriptures So uh, about the Passover. And the disciples, this is from Mark chapter 14 verse 19, the disciples did as Jesus appointed to them and they prepared the Pasch. Verse 26, and while they were at supper, Jesus took bread and blessed and broke and then he made bread a symbol of his body. And then he took wine as well, made it a symbol of his, of his, uh, uh, shed blood. And, uh, 
That's in Luke 22, verses 19 through through 26. And you can very clearly notice in that section of the scripture, dear friends, that Jesus broke the bread on Passover, Pasch, or Pascha means Passover. He also, the Apostle Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, followed Jesus' practice and broke the bread as well, and he used the wine. Well, so, the early Christian liturgy, you might say, is totally different from what we have today. Until next time, goodbye, friends.